Welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a 50-year-old journalist on a mission to learn about and share good information around ageing well and how to look and feel good for as long as possible. And from surgical procedures to injectables, thread lifts, energy-based skin rejuvenating treatments, peels and more, there is a vast array of clinical options these days for resurfacing, lifting and tightening skin, as well as enhancing our features. But are there some we should be more wary of than others? Today, I'm talking to two of my favourite aesthetic medical specialists. They are Dr. Chen Xu and Dr. Emmeline Ashley, and you can find out more about them in the description. But they're both highly qualified and experienced doctors who join me to discuss which cosmetic treatments and procedures we'd most likely avoid and why. Welcome back, Dr. Chen and Dr. Emmeline. Hi, Claire. Good to be back. Hi, it's good to see you both. Um, well, today we are talking about uh, the procedures or treatments we never have. And I've been looking forward to this one because with your individual knowledge and experience of aesthetic treatments, I think it's going to flush out some interesting information for our audience. And I'm going to get the ball rolling uh, with one of mine. And that's buckle fat removal. My understanding is that buckle fat removal involves surgical extraction of fat tissue from your lower cheek area. Is that right? That's where the buckle fat is. And that's in order to give it a more kind of defined look. And we've seen quite a few celebrities who appear to have undergone this procedure. Speculation has been particularly rife around the former One Direction star Liam Payne's new highly chiselled look, let's call it chiselled look, um, which some experts uh, are, are speculating could be something like buckle fat removal. And um, I mean, the way I see it is, is particularly for young people. I mean, I remember when I was in my teens, 20s and 30s even, having a round face, I must have had a healthy amount of buckle fat and I hated it. And you know, back then, I think if I'd had the chance, I would have been quite compelled to go and do something about it, um, just because I just I just wanted to look like everybody else. And now that I'm older and I'm trying to hang on to that facial volume, you know, it's the one thing I'm really glad um, that that I, I that I've kind of started out from that base. So, you know, having that so young, what it means it feels like to me is that they're going to have to start replacing that at some point in the future <laughs> because this look is going to get more and more dramatic and it's going to age them very dramatically. I would hate to think that younger people feel the need to do that. But um, I mean, let's let's start with you, Dr. Emmeline. Buckle fat removal. What do you think about it in principle? I don't think it's something that I would want to get done myself um, for several reasons. And I think you've highlighted one of the really important ones mm -hmm. um, in terms of long term consequences and that we don't we really don't know what the long term effects are. Mm -hmm. But we do understand when you look at the face and you think about how the face ages, our facial fat pads are really, really important. Mm -hmm. And atrophy of a lot of the deep fat pads. So they just naturally shrink as we get older. And actually, this area here, following in this area, it's very difficult to treat and it's something that patients of mine who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, they ask about it a lot. Um, we also know the buckle fat pad is, is actually quite stable throughout your life. So it's not one of those fat pads that dramatically atrophies or um, changes. So you're removing one of the few kind of stable areas of volume that you would have. And I think you're exactly right, that is potentially going to really prematurely age you. Mm. I think the other thing to consider is any surgery, any treatment has risks associated with them. Surgical treatments have higher risk. You've got really important branches of the facial nerve that run in, you know, around that fat pad. Um, and you can risk injuring or damaging them for a purely cosmetic treatment that we don't know what the long term potential complications are. So I do, I do know a lot of facial plastic surgeons um, don't do this or they might have done it in the past and they've sort of stepped away from it. Um, obviously, it's not, I'm not a plastic surgeon, so it's not a treatment I would be doing anyway, but I would be very, very cautious about approaching this treatment. And when you say it's not that easy, because I thought, well, I suppose they're thinking that in this day and age, you know, you take it out and then when you're ready, you put it back in. Maybe not as easy though to get that natural look when you're putting it back in? 
No, it's not. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's, we experience that daily with our patients is when we're trying to restore things and have it look natural. It is difficult, it is an art form. And so taking away those natural fat pads might look fine when you're younger, but if you think about how it's going to look down the line, I, like I said, I think you're right. It will probably be very prematurely aging. Dr. Chan, would you agree with that? I agree with both of you. And I think the issue here is that when it comes to doing aesthetic treatments in the younger people, Mm. it's always, um, or just in general, I mean, it's always a balance between um, what we're trying to achieve. Like, are we trying to beautify the face according to certain beauty ideals or are we treating the face for anti-aging purposes and I think the young people who are getting the, the buckle fat removal are aiming for a certain kind of look that they feel is more beautiful so they're trying to they're doing it for beautification rather than thinking about the long-term consequences of what would happen as their face ages um, for me personally I approach aesthetics more from a Um, an age prevention and anti-aging angle I don't really do aesthetics purely just for beautification because I feel that we have to think about the long-term consequences Mm -hmm. of the face whatever we do um, to someone in their 20s it's going to have some sort of consequences as they get older yeah let's work with what we've got no I I think it's quite sad to see actually on these um, younger celebrities who just suddenly look very different and you're like "Mm mm-hmm okay um yeah i hope they i hope they don't regret it in the years to come um dr emily let's go back to you uh you know having seen all these treatments in your time um which which one would you not have so i've got sort of two big things that i really hate when i look at aesthetics treatments so one of them um is obviously safety that's always a big red flag thing is that Um, when we're doing treatments we always have to have safety in mind and also this whole idea of tracing chasing trends which we've kind of already touched upon Mm -hmm. why are you actually doing something trends change fashion changes are we doing things in the best interest of Mm -hmm. the patient Um, so one of the treatments I would never ever have done and would never recommend anyone else have done is using a hyaluron pen so I don't know personally of any medical injectors who use this device, but I know it's been used at home as sort of a DIY lip filler treatment. And I know it's used sometimes by non-medical injectors. And it's something a few years ago that I just saw all over social media, TikTok, Instagram trending of people using these pens. And you can- On themselves. Yeah, or on other people. And they could be bought on Amazon and eBay. How does it work, Dr. Emmeline? Tell us like, what, what, what does it do? So it's marketed as a needle-free pen, Mm -hmm. so supposedly safer. Um, Needle-free injector pens have been used in medicine. Uh, They're commonly used in the management of diabetic patients who need insulin, so are having to self-administer lots of injections a day. They are not intended for aesthetic use. So these pens, they're spring-loaded mechanical devices, um, medically referred to as jet injectors. And they work by creating enough external pressure on the tissue to blast hyaluronic acid filler into the skin without a needle. So, I mean, to me already, that sounds terrifying and horrific. Yeah. Um, and like I said, they they were advertised quite widely as, as being very risk-free because there's no needle and they're painless. But the reality is there's no data to support those statements. Um, and they're not FDA approved at all in the United States. And FDA is sort of one of those things we look to for our safety data because they're very strict on safety. Um, they even issued a warning statement a couple of years ago saying that they were aware of really serious injuries, um, in some cases, permanent harm to skin, lips, um, eyes, with the use of these needle free devices for the injection of fillers. And like I said, originally, in medicine, these were not designed to be used with fillers. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's definitely something I would never, ever have done. Oh, wow. And maybe what, like in, uh, people getting skin infections and so on from using these things. And it's quite a traumatic thing. I mean, they say it's needle free, but you're literally creating so much external pressure that you're blasting things into the tissue. Um, you have no control really of where it's going, um, the depth that it's going to. And so you're risking all the things that you risk already with filler. So things like vascular occlusion, where filler can, you know, go into a blood vessel. 
and without any of the control that you would have in the hands of in a medical injector. So yeah. to me, it's complete no go. Yeah. Mm. No, that doesn't sound so good. Dr. Chen, are you familiar with this trend? <laughs> yes, I yeah, I was aware of it a few years back and I just thought, what a ridiculous thing. It's mm. so dangerous. Um it, it, it basically with with this these penless devices, you have no control over where the filler goes. Like, you know, even if it wasn't so um even if it didn't create so much trauma in, in the tissues, like you have no control over it. So how are you gonna give you like if you're trying to do a lip filler just thinking in terms of the results that you would get it's so you know random like you could get more on one side less on the other side and that's without even thinking of any of any risk like why yeah. would everyone do that to themselves first of all and secondly um with this device as dr emily said so so much pressure um that needs to be created to push to drive the hyaluronic acid into the skin without a needle it essentially is just going to bruise the lips and there have been reported cases of vascular occlusion um so actually it is possible to cause that kind of serious damage without a needle so definitely these devices are not safer um they are not more effective okay. the results are not better there's nothing about it that's better than a, a needle and a experienced injector doing the treatment yeah okay that sounds like a definite no um dr chen what would you not have done <laughs> my biggest no-no is thread lifting um this is a right. treatment that why <laughs> well i'm saying right that kind of i find i find that quite surprising because i thought that was quite mainstream and you know lightweight so i trained to do it quite a few years back and I was I was horrified at the training course actually. Um, just some of the some of the results that I was seeing on that training course, it, it just it that it wasn't pretty. And I did a few treatments, and I was very careful about selecting my clients. Um, you know, because the, the essentially thread lifting it works by um, using a, a thread made out of material called PDO, which is dissolvable over over several weeks. It's the same threads that surgeons would use um the type of thread that they would leave inside uh, mm -hmm. when they suture up mm -hmm. um, deep wounds and it would over several weeks it would be absorbed by the body so these threads are essentially inserted under the skin that and they have the, the threads that create the lift they've got these little kind of spikes on them a uh, bit like a barbed wire so you basically insert it under the skin um with a with a long with a cannula you leave it under the skin and then these little spikes sort of hook onto the underside of the skin and you essentially just lift the skin up oh, oh. it is a it is a physical kind of movement you just lift the skin up basically so it it sounds like it would be good and it'll be effective and it does cause a lift mm -hmm. but the problem I have with it is that it doesn't it doesn't reduce the amount of skin you have it doesn't improve the skin quality and so you are basically moving skin from like one area of the face to another mm -hmm. and what you end up with is like bunching up of the skin somewhere at the oh. top so and there's the tension on the skin as well it just it is really unnatural it can give you this sort of unnaturally kind of tight appearance to your mm. to your face for several weeks and you, you're restricted in making um your natural uh, normal facial expressions um and the results don't really last that long either um from what i've heard and it's quite painful um and it just is quite traumatic and also what i've seen is some people who have had threads many years ago now are left with these sort of looks like trap marks um tension lines in the in the face where the threads are no longer there but the um kind of scar tissue or the extra tissue that's produced because of the thread being there at the time has just caused um kind of like adhesions under the skin so that when they make certain expressions you can just see these lines in the face under the skin where the threads used to be um no that's off my list now. No. And the other thing is I've spoken to several um, plastic surgeon friends, contacts, and I've asked them, you know, what's your, what's your opinion on threads? And they said, oh, it's a nightmare when you, um, people who've had threads 
um, later than going for um, facelift. It's a nightmare doing the surgery for them because there's lots of adhe adhesions under the skin. It takes a long time to clear all that. And then the results from their facelift sometimes are not as good because of all mm -hmm. the adhesions. Um, so they just said steer clear from it. It's not a good thing. It, yeah, it doesn't sound like it. Um, Dr. Emily, have you got any experience with thread lifts? No, it, so it's not a treatment I do myself and it's a treatment I, so I agree with Dr. Chen, everything that she mm -hmm. said, it's something I have zero interest in training in um, for all the reasons that she's already described. Um, I think you also have to think about, you know, complications occur even in the best of hands that just, they happen in medicine. If a thread were to get an in, infected or anything like that, you can't remove it because it's barbed, it's hooked into the skin. And I have seen really nasty complications from threads. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that whole issue of longevity is, is important because they're, they're very expensive treatments for patients to get. So people will save up for a long time to be able to afford this thread lift, which is presented to them as quite a safe minor surgical procedure that will give them really good results um, halfway to a facelift. And it's just, it's not a facelift. Um, I've never seen any evidence that the results last longer than six months. Um, and again, spoken to lots of colleagues who have trained in threads, who have done some threads and then who have stepped away from them. Because I think as clinicians, we do want to deliver for our patients. Yeah. Um, and if we if we feel like something's not giving a good result, then w why are we doing it? Um, and, and again, I've all the plastic surgeons I've ever spoken to hate thread lifts. Mm, so that's it, really it's interesting. Not something. Yeah. And I, and I, like you said, it is quite mainstream in our industry. Mm. Still, lots of clinicians who do it. And maybe they are seeing good results and their their patients are happy but um it's it's not something i'm really interested in doing myself yeah okay right that's a big cross through that uh the next one is one that i would have actually again but one that i feel that i shouldn't so it's a slightly complicated one and i'm thinking more well i'm thinking of two things really it's the, those heat based clinical treatments, the L therapies and the radio frequency treatments or ultrasound and radio frequency treatments. Um, and I've had L therapy before and found it really effective around the jowls. I got, I got a lift, I got a definite lift. Um, but I have had comments from people for who those treatments have gone wrong. And I have seen pictures that have been sent to me of um, of women who have lost, who have whose facial fat has has melted. Some have been left in pain, and I find it so difficult when people ask me, "Oh, would you have this?" or "Should I have this?" Um, because I don't want to say to people, "No, no, don't, I wouldn't do that." What I've come to believe is that it is practitioner dependent. And if you get somebody who is experienced and um, knows what they're doing, basically, I think most people should be okay, really. I think what happens is that sometimes these these machines are just used by people who, um, you know, don't understand the, the biology. And for whatever reason, I, I, I do think that there can be issues with them. But as I said, I had health therapy, it was successful for me and I would consider having it again just around the jowl area. But I, I wanted to get your takes on this because, you know, Do Dr. Chen, I know that you've seen some very good results for clients. It's um, it is a really interesting discussion. Um, the topic of fat melting, um, you know, actually lots of people want to get rid of excess fat and they struggle to get get rid of it. And other people who don't want to get rid of it, finding that they are just losing it very easily. Um, I think when it comes to heat based, not heat based, energy based treatments that do yeah. heat in the skin, the mechanism of um, the the sort of fat melting. Um, is really through um, a lot of excess heat being put into the skin for a prolonged period of time mm. because but and, and that's would be really painful by the way it's, mm -hmm. it's not very easily tolerated to have um i think it's something like you need to have 40 degrees um for at least three to five seconds to cause the fat cells to to die basically and that's really really painful so 
all these treatments, like all therapy, thermage, I do both of these treatments mm -hmm. in the clinic um, and I see great results from them. Mm -hmm. And the thing is with those treatments, if, um, if it's done within the sort of safe energy levels and also with um, working with the clients to, to, I always tell them, you know, let me know if it's getting too painful. Um, if it feels too hot, you let me know. And then I can adjust the energy levels according to their response. So some people, because it's painful, some people want to have numbing cream apply for a really long time. And so, it, you know, and they really dull the pain um, and they want to have as high energy as possible. And if that was the case, then it would be more likely that they're doing more damage if they're applying the heat to the skin for longer. Yes, yeah. the tightening result would be better, but also it's more likely then to stimulate the fat cells to die as well. So it's a fine balance, um, I think. And it's in the hands of an experienced practitioner who understands this, the the clients, they shouldn't have any problems with the, with the fat loss because, you know, this is something that I'm always very conscious of and I would make sure that I don't cause a fat loss, that I would just try to give them the desired result. And actually, old therapy is really effective for lifting the lower face. And it's mm. something that I'm actually going to have myself as well um, in about a month's time. That's my plan. Can't wait to see the result. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really interesting. And it's like whenever I talk about um, at home radio frequency devices or whatever, that really chimes with what I say to people, which is keep them moving. Just do not linger for any long period of time with these things. Just keep it moving. Um, and, uh, you know, you can never be too cautious, really. Uh, Dr. Emmeline, what's your take on the energy based treatments? Yeah, I mean, I, I do do some of them myself as well. Mm -hmm. I do think it's very much practitioner dependent and you need mm -hmm. someone who's really well trained and knows what they're doing. I think it probably can be quite easy to to accidentally, even in just one little spot, melt fat if if yeah. you're not experienced enough not quite sure about what you're doing um what we're trying to target when we're tightening you know the connective tissue layer which in theory should be about 4.5 millimeters beneath the skin but then everyone's anatomy is a little bit different yeah um a lot of these ultrasound devices they don't have um screens or imaging so it is actually i feel like it's a bit of a guessing game that mm. about whether or not you are in the correct layer um, I know the old therapy device does have a screen, which is great. So you can actually visualize what you're doing. Um, but I do think it's something that patients maybe aren't sometimes made aware of enough yeah. ahead of time. Um, and so if they were to get a little bit of fat melting in an area, it is really, really disappointing and it's heartbreaking and, and understandably so. Um, so yeah, again, I think you just have to make sure that you go to someone who really knows what they're doing. And, th and that yeah. can be hard to gauge, can't it? Yeah. It's the clinics that have lots of reviews, lots of happy clients, word of mouth. You have you have friends or you you know people that have been and and um and that they're medically trained. I, I mean, I just think of it something like that. You probably want a doctor, you know, um, doctor or a nurse, as somebody who has a good grasp of biology <laughs> would be helpful. <laughs> um, okay, that's helpful. Uh, I'm glad that we had that conversation. Um, let's go to Dr. Chen now. Um, what's, what's the second treatment you wouldn't have done? So the second treatment that I wouldn't personally have done myself, but I think in certain cases would be beneficial for, for certain indications is, um, tissue stimulators like Sculptra or Radies. The, these are kind of, um, injectable treatments that stimulate your own tissues to, to grow essentially to boost the volume in the face. Um, I think a lot of people have heard of Sculptra or Radies. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the big, big brands. I'm sure there are other ones too. I've, the problem I have with these products is that, that you can't really control what happens once you've injected these into your, um, under the skin. So they will stimulate your, your tissues to, um, to produce more connective tissue, more collagen and boost the volume, which sounds great in theory. But if you overproduce, if your body is, you know, very active and you produce too much of that volume, you can end up with a face that looks really puffy, really overfilled. And I've seen this happen. Um, and I've seen this happen to to some really great aesthetic doctors, um, you know, and, and 
it is not a good look and it's, it's not really reversible. Um, so in terms of safety, anything like this that's not reversible um, is a big no-no for me because with hyaluronic acid, um, if there was a complication, then we can use an, an enzyme called hyaluronidase to dissolve it um to essentially reverse that and it just or if um for example if someone had some some filler and they really didn't like it for whatever reason um then it can be dissolved i'm not saying that you should just have filler and then have it dissolved it doesn't quite work like that but what i'm saying is that it is possible to dissolve if needed so that gives that sort of an added layer of safety with hyaluronic acid and with all these other ones that are not dissolvable um that stimulate your tissue they just, you just can't you know i think it's the not being able to control what happens once you've once you've injected and the permanent um nature of it that yeah. really Oh, that would be very upsetting if it went wrong. I mean, what what's in it? What's it doing? What what? How how does it work? In other words, so it's it's a substance that essentially um, stimulates it. it when whatever um, substance you inject under the skin, when there's a kind of a foreign foreign body, essentially, it stimulates it activates the tissues to um, produce more collagen and to some some of it is sort of like fibrotic almost like scar tissue but it's with collagen as well just extra um tissue under the skin so it's a mixture of all the different things sculpture in particular is used in um certain people with so some people with hiv they mm -hmm. lose fat and um, fat pad yeah. in their face and it, they get this hollowing in their lower face mm -hmm. in the in the buckle area that can look very just makes them look very unwell um mm -hmm. So in those people who have suffered that fat pad loss, Sculpture have been used to treat those cases very successfully, um, mm. giving them a very natural look. But, you know, but we're talking about people who have had a, like an abnormal amount of fat loss in their face due to an illness that they have. And I have also had some of the, the women who have told me about their um, more extreme facial fat loss through treatments that have gone wrong have mentioned Sculptra. So in those cases, I think sculpture can be very beneficial, but it's mm. a very fine line. I think in someone with um, normal facial volume, yeah. um, or ratios, uh, you know, I, I don't think those people need anything yeah. like this. Um, true, stick, true. To, stick to the straightforward hyaluronic acid. It works beautifully, it's safer, it's easy to control. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've not had any problems with it really. Uh, Dr. Emmeline, have you had experience with Sculptra? Again, it's not a treatment that I do. And I think Dr. Chen and I are always on the same page for very similar reasons. You haven't coached, you, you haven't checked either. You know, it's not a setup. Um, that's 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 interesting. You've both steered clear. Well, the opposite ends of the UK, but I know. we're on the same page. <laughs> but yeah, the, the thing that immediately makes me really nervous about these semi-permanent or stimulatory fillers is the fact that they're not reversible and that they're whatever you're doing is, you know, permanent um and in emergency situations i just think you have to be if you're doing something where there if it go if it goes wrong there's not much that can be done to remedy that then you need to be thinking really carefully about why you're doing it and mm. what you're achieving with it and if it's worth that risk so again i'm big fan of fillers i love my hyaluronic acid fillers but that's because i know that there is nothing that can go wrong with a hyaluronic acid filler that i cannot fix so i'm very comfortable and confident that when a patient comes to me, I can tell them you are in completely safe hands and, you know, we'll within reason, we'll come to um, sort of expectations together about what we want to achieve. And I can deliver that to you safely. The second I can't say that with 100% certainty, then I don't want to be doing the treatment because yeah. I, I don't think it's fair for the patient. No, it makes sense. And that's good to know. Um, that just leaves you with your second choice, Dr. Emily. What what would you avoid? So again, and we've touched on this a lot, um, it's this whole idea of chasing trends in aesthetics and that medicine should never be directed by trends. So the other big thing that's happening on social media at the moment that you might have seen is this so-called butterfly lip trend or lip taping. Mm -hmm. um, and again, this is an example where people, I just feel like they're not thinking about the actual evidence and reasoning behind what is being done so the trend involves dissolving and filling lips at the same time and then using tape 
to hold the lips in place. And absolutely zero of that makes sense to me. So tape so where? I mean, I'm thinking, well, what, what, they're putting tape on the outside of the yeah, Well, exactly. So they're putting stereo strips on the outside of lips. So what exactly is that going to do to filler within an anatomical space in the lips? I don't know. Is this as part of the treatment and then the tape's removed after the treatment and it leaves a kind of looks so meant to be the tape is meant to be left there for about 24 hours after treatment so first of all that's an infection risk you're putting tape over where you've been injected um it can hide things potentially from you so you've got lips that are all taped up you know are you mm -hmm. having bruising or are you having the beginning of a vascular occlusion mm -hmm can't really see what's happening to the lips immediately post-treatment and that is actually really important for safety to be able to see it um you know the idea that putting a bit of stereo stripping on a lip is going to change what's happening inside the lips just makes zero sense to me and that person is going to be you know they're going to be eating talking drinking their lips are not going to be perfectly still so that tape's probably shifting around anyway um so that 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 bit of it is just ridiculous to me um but the other piece of it the dissolving and filling at the same time you know it's so gimmicky and we know when we put that enzyme that prescription product in a lip to dissolve that it will spread um in ways that we can't control and that it continues to work over a period of time and again there's absolutely no data on what happens to hyaluronic acid if you're injecting it and dissolving it simultaneously within such a short period of time. So, you know, if we do need to dissolve lips for any reason, we give it two weeks before we would go back to refill, whether we're dissolving because it's, um, you know, electively that someone's not happy with their outcome or dissolving in an emergency situation. We don't refill right away. We wait. We wait for all the tissue inflammation to settle down and for that hyaluronic, um, that hyalase prescription in the tissues to stop working so it's not going to break down any filler that we then subsequently put in so again it's it's made for um some interesting instagram posts that people see they see these yeah. up lips and it's sort of um you know people say oh it's amazing new technique that's been invented and we've trademarked it and we're dissolving and filling at the same time to really sculpt the lips but it's nonsense there's no science behind it so again yeah. it's one of those things where i just I find it really frustrating in aesthetics when I see things like this, um, where it is all just about oh, getting um, getting attention on social yeah. media, getting yeah, something gimmicky and new so that you you get followers and you get people booking in. Um, and it feels like you know you're either taking advantage of people, not completely understanding the science behind the treatment, and there's no reason why people need to. That that's your job to be really well informed and educated so that you're only providing good evidence based treatments or you don't understand it yourself if you're offering this and again then you shouldn't be injecting yeah. so um, that's it's a big no no for me a big no well no my husband suggested i tape my lips a few times but it wasn't for the butterfly effects <laughs> dr chen uh have you heard of this butterfly look what do we call it butterfly just butterfly lips butterfly, butterfly lips, lips. Yeah. Do you know what I um when Dr. Emmeline mentioned it uh last the last couple of weeks, that was the first time I had to come across it because I actually don't really go on social media because mm -hmm. I just think these trends are just ridiculous. <laughs> Although I did give myself the butterfly haircut and that worked brilliantly. But anyway, that's I have no problem with butterflies. <laughs> it's just <laughs> but just not lips just not lips i mean people have to be just been trying to do all these clever things with lips different things trying to make people's lips look different to what they're meant to look like um and i think what it, it's so misleading because what the general public don't realize is that they might see um someone who have had a, had a, a type of um a treatment that's given them a certain shape to their lips but they're actually the shape of their lips probably were similar to that already mm -hmm. um, whereas their own lips are actually completely different shape to that person in the picture so if they come to me and, and show me a picture of someone else's lips and say oh, can you make my lips look like that then I'm like no I can't because your your lip your natural lip shape is not that shape you you can't it's really difficult verging on impossible to change someone's sh the shape of someone's lips to to be a different shape 
Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So the most that we can do with a filler, with a lip filler, is to boost volume for the of the lips. Um, if you try to change the shapes, then immediately after the treatment, it might look quite nice, but very soon the filler will settle in and it will kind of you will lose that sort of shape very quickly, and the mm -hmm. and the lips just becomes more. <sighs> don't know just just not the shape that you want so yeah. it's it's very difficult so I always have to explain this to people so I actually don't like doing lip filler for young people who are chasing a certain look where I find yeah. lip filler is very beneficial are in those people who are starting to lose the volume in their in their lips yeah. from the process of aging so a lot of, pretty much everything I do is is more about anti-aging and and how to restore the face to look more like a youthful face so this butterfly lips is a complete no-no for me I would never never do it um I would if someone comes to me asking for it I would say I'm not doing it. Find someone else who will do it or, um, you know, we'll, we'll do something else. Well, don't refer them to Dr. Emily because she's not doing it either. No, she's not doing them either. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I've learned a lot um, and I've enjoyed that. I knew I would. I hope the people at home have enjoyed it too and that we'll see you both back on the channel very soon. Thank you. So Thank much. you very much. That was fun. I hope you enjoyed today's discussion. You'll find lots more like this one right here on the channel. And if you'd like to see or listen to future interviews and reviews from me, then just hit subscribe. As always, I love to hear your thoughts and experiences. So let me know if you've tried any treatments or procedures and would recommend them or would urge others to think twice. Thanks for your time today and I'll see you soon.